my shoes and out the door. Five, I'm alive, six, seven, eight, feeling great. Hello and welcome back to Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer and I am your co-host. Today our guest is Dr. Stephen Masley. Dr. Masley is a physician, nutritionist, author, speaker, and award-winning patient educator. He has devoted his medical career to the study of heart disease and aging and has published significant research on these subjects in leading medical journals. His passion is empowering people to achieve optimal health through comprehensive medical assessments and lifestyle changes. Dr. Masley has received the award of fellow from three prestigious organizations, the American Heart Association, the American College of Nutrition, and the American Academy of Family Physicians. He's also a clinical assistant professor at the University of South Florida, and he teaches programs at Eckerd College. Dr. Masley sees patients from across North America at the Masley Optimal Health Center in St. Petersburg, Florida. Dr. Masley has published several health books, Smart Fat, the most recent, the 30-Day Heart Tune-Up, 10 Years Younger, and numerous scientific articles. His work has been featured on the Discovery Channel, the Today Show, Public Broadcasting Service, PBS, plus over 250 media interviews. He also completed a chef internship at Four Seasons Restaurant in Seattle and has performed cooking demonstrations at Canyon Ranch, Pritikin Longevity Center, and on multiple TV appearances. You can visit... Dr. Masley's website at the end of this interview at www.drmasley.com. Dr. Masley, how are you today? Oh, I'm delighted to be here with you, Noah. This is really quite a pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy too. So why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm, a, as you said, a physician nutritionist trained chef, and I really believe that we can give people delicious food that they could eat more often that would transform their health for the better, that they would feel better, they would look better, they'd be sexier, they would have less aches and pains, they'd have better brain performance, and they'd get prevent heart disease. So all of that's possible if we eat the right food. The challenge is cutting through all the hype we've been given over years and getting to a clear, smart message. This is what I appreciate about your work so much, that you want to present food that's delicious, just the same way Mark Sisson is doing with his Primal Kitchen. You want things to taste good and be nutritious at the same time. Absolutely. Now, now let's a simple question. Uh, in your perspective, number one cause for heart disease, memory loss, weight gain, and diabetes? It's elevated blood sugar. It's that we eat too much refined carbs, too much sugar, sweeteners, flour, even whole grain flour. We're not active enough. And our lifestyle does not match the genes we've been given for the last 100,000 years. We have a lifestyle that's totally in disaccord with our genetic makeup. And that if you follow something that's closer to what we were originally designed to follow, we're going to get much better results and feel fantastic. Now, we know obviously refined carbohydrates dramatically raise blood sugar. Uh, we also know that excessive protein um, raises can raise blood sugar. But what's, what's the one nutrient that doesn't raise blood sugar, Dr. Masley? Well, fat doesn't. I mean, that's an interesting thing. When you eat fat from olive oil or nuts or, you know, fat does not raise blood sugar. That's a pretty f – and we've been avoiding fat for years, right? Yeah. You know, and, and I, was, I have to admit, I used to work at the Pritikin Longevity Center back in the 90s, and that is what we taught was – Less fat, no fat, avoid the fat. It wasn't zero fat, but it was pretty low fat, very, very low fat. And people couldn't follow it. Their food didn't taste good. It wasn't satisfying. I think they had cognitive dysfunction, depression, anxiety from the low-fat diet. They weren't nourishing their brain, which needs fat. And um, we could have had much better results if we'd put in some fat back into that diet. All right, so you, you, you kind of outlined it, but get a little bit deeper for our audience. So what is wrong with the low-fat message? Well, first, it's really hard to follow. I mean, 95% of our patients were highly motivated. They paid a lot of money, and they couldn't follow it, even though we tried to get them, taught them how to make it easier to do a low-fat diet. So it's not easy to do. Two, um, point number two is that, you need fat to lower, mark, things that accelerate aging. And I would say the two 
prominent factors that accelerate aging, make people fat, I'm tired, achy, fall apart before your time, are inflammation and abnormal blood sugar control. And you need fat to lower inflammation and to improve blood sugar control. But it's got to be the right fats. It's not just any fat, but adding the right fats makes your food taste better. And we lower inflammation. We in markedly improve blood sugar control. And as a result, we stop, accelerate aging, and give people their health back. Okay, so your newest book is called Smart Fat. I, I'd have it in front of me today, but it's already at, it's out in my lending library in my office. But you kind of coined the term farts, uh, uh, fat smart. So if you could please tell our audience what a smart fat is, that'd be great. Well, smart fats have clear, clinically proven benefits. Things like, you know, wild salmon or nuts or olive oil. Any study you look at, Clinical studies, not just for a blood test improvement, but hopefully something more meaningful like less heart attacks, less strokes, less memory loss, less diabetes. Um, so there are specific fats that have been studied and proven definitively to improve your health. So I label smart fats as those that have cl proven clinical results that make a difference for you. Okay. So... So we have olive oil, we have the omega-3s in salmon, uh, avocados, olives. Are there any other small, uh, fats that are considered small? Nuts. I mean, every uh, study that's ever looked at nuts, so they're especially my favorite six, almonds, pecans, walnuts, pistachios, hazelnuts, and macadamians. Those six all have proven benefit. Um, but there's also dark chocolate. I mean, we absolutely should be eating dark chocolate for that healthy fat every day. I mean, really good for our, especially cardiovascular health, but brain health too. And then, um, you know, then and all the nut oils as well, like almond oil and um macadamia nut oil those are really nice and avocado oil those are awesome oils to cook with avocado oil and almond oil and then there's kind of a smart fat that has a little bit of controversy and that gets into the whole coconut oil and coconut nut you know yeah. process too that's another potential smart fat for some people may be controversial for others uh, do you want to dive into coconut right now or you want to hit that later dr mouse we could do that now sure yeah, so, so uh, coconut has some clear benefits. You know, it lowers, inf it helps, it, it fights infections. It's great fuel. So for, you know, an athlete who's working out, if I'm going to do a two, two and a half hour bike ride and I want to keep up with a bike club, I'm going to add some coconut oil because those midi medium chain triglycerides are really good fuel you can burn. Um, it may not help me sitting on the couch, but it does help me when I'm doing a hard two-hour bike ride. So it fights infections. And there's a lot of pending data out there that it's good for our brain, that it protects our brain when we eat these medium-chain triglycerides from coconut oil and coconut milk and things like that. So it has these benefits. The controversy is on heart disease, that when you add coconut oil, like I was just had a patient today in my office who's added coconut oil, about two tablespoons a day, because someone told them to, and their cholesterol went up 70 points, and their LDL cholesterol went up 70 points. And, you know, in, in studies, it shows it's bigger and fluffier, which probably is a good thing. But on people with heart disease, when they give them coconut oil, they had artery dysfunction, and that's very concerning that maybe these aren't good for people with known heart disease. Or if you're on a cholesterol med and we might have to increase your medication, I'd rather have someone have other fats. So for my bottom line, not trying to make it too confusing, is that they're really good for sports, they're good for your brain, um, but if you have known heart disease or on your cholesterol drug, I would prefer to use other fats until we get scientific data showing that they're really safe and good for your heart. Now, hope that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Now, prior to reading your book, I used coconut oil uh, to to stir fry vegetables a little bit, and, and some of my meats a little bit more than I do now after reading your book. Um, it's not a great idea to use coconut oil at a medium to high heat. Is that correct? You're absolutely right, Noah. Because when you cook it, it, so here is here is a big myth about coconut oil. All these chefs were using it, right? 
and um, they liked the flavor, but they missed the critical scientific point that the smoke point, the heat at which the oil is damaged, is only 350 degrees, which is really medium low. So when you heat coconut oil at high heat, you, you basically damage the free fatty acids in it. Um, it's not all saturated fat. There's some really highly nutritious fatty acids in it. They're damaged and they're hydrogenated. So basically, you're converting coconut oil into embalming fluid when you heat it at high heat. Okay. So you, you could use it at a, at a low to medium heat. Is that possible? Well, yeah, like last night for dinner. I mean, I <laughs> used coconut oil in a, and I made a curry dish. So I sauteed my veggies and protein in avocado oil. And when I turned it down to simmer at the end, I added a can of coconut milk. And you could have used coconut oil too. But I added it at the end when it was on simmer to add that flavor. And then all the nutrients are maintained and it's not damaged. I absolutely should not have used coconut oil or um, coconut milk and cooked it at high heat. That's the key. You can still use it. Just wait and put it on at the end when you reduce the temperature down to simmer. And avocado oil, this is really interesting to me because I love to cook as well. Avocado oil, it has a higher smoke point. Is that what oh, you're oh, over 500 degrees. I mean, so you can cook at high heat. And avocado oil tolerates that pretty well. I mean, I usually cook it medium high just not to over burn my food. Right. So, but when I do most of my veggies or protein, I'm going to, you know, I want a little bit of sear. It seals the outside and it doesn't get mushy. It has, still has a nice al dente, you know, cr you know, t texture to it. So there's something nice about, you know, or if you're doing meat or chicken, getting a little sear to it. Um, just that touch. I'm really, I think it looks better and it tastes better and the texture's better. So medium high heat is a nice cooking, but many oils can't tolerate that. Extra virgin olive oil, sesame oil, they, they're destroyed at, at medium high heat. So avocado oil is great. You can also use almond oil or macadamia nut oil. You could use clarified butter. You can't use regular butter. You can use ghee or clarified butter at higher heat. It tolerates medium high heat. So those would all be good cooking oils. Now, I call butter neutral. I mean, we maybe talk about that. So I wouldn't, I can't tell you that clarified butter is good for you, but I don't think it's bad for you. And, and if, as long as it's clarified or a ghee, what we call ghee. Yeah. That, that leads into my, it's a beautiful segue into my next question. I was going to ask you, where does butter and ghee fit into this? And I know you also distinguish what a, a neutral fat is. So how about describing yeah. that a little bit more? Well, for years, we told people to avoid dairy and fatty meats because the saturated fat gave them a heart attack, right? I mean, you've heard that. Oh, Hasn't sure. everybody heard that? Yep. Um, and this came up in the 1970s and then the 80s and then the 90s, but no one. So this was a political social point. There was never any evidence to prove that from the beginning. It was all based on some really bad, um, distorted data. And um, we've subsequently, in the last couple of years, they went back and looked at all the scientific evidence from the 70s and the 80s, and they could find nothing that proved that saturated fat from dairy and meats hurt people's health. And there was this huge, big publication out two years ago, um, and several more to go along with it, that showed that there's no evidence that saturated fat from butter and, and animal meats increase heart attack risk. So we had people avoid this for over 20 years for a myth. And that's really tragic because all that time they were avoiding saturated fat, they were busy adding more sugar and flour in, to make up for it. And they really hurt their health in the process. So we spent 20 years sadly, um, avoiding saturated fat when we should have been avoiding sugar and flour. And the big point, though, is, is it clean? There's a difference between neutral fat. So I would say if you're cooking with clarified butter or ghee, that's neutral. It's not going to help you, but I, and it's not going to hurt you. I can't show you any evidence, scientific evidence, that says butter prevents heart disease or cancer or something like that. But it's not bad for it. But here's the big difference. The difference between neutral and bad fat would be, what if you gave that animal growth hormones to make them fat and you fed them 
grains like corn and then plus soy products that were loaded with toxic chemicals and pesticides and Roundup, then that animal fat would be toxic. So we're only talking organic, grass-fed, cage-free animal protein and dairy sources. We're not talking animals that have been fed hormones and antibiotics because all those chemicals would be in the fat. So if it's organic, um, basically you can say animal protein and dairy is totally neutral. There's no reason you shouldn't be able to enjoy it. That sounds Fantastic to me. Now, I want to talk about a few other things, too, if you don't mind. How about um, where does fiber fit into your plan? And then how about – you? I like this this nomenclature as well, too. Protein, or you say between clean or mean protein. So how about – let's talk about those two things. Well, let's do clean or mean protein because that – just what you know, just what I was saying, like between dairy and animal protein, is it neutral or toxic – has to do with what was it fed and their chemicals in the protein. And most of that really, most of the protein, whether we're talking grass-fed beef versus, you know, grass-fed beef would mean you're not, it's just eating grass. We're not giving it pesticide-enriched grains, and we're not injecting those animals with hormones to eat them, make them fat. So when we eat that animal protein, we get the hormones, and the hormones make us fat. So it's got to be clean instead of mean. And that's a very important um, concept for this whole smart fat idea. Now, fiber, if I really had you do one thing, but this isn't controversial. I don't think there's anybody, well, there might be a few people out there, but very few serious scientists or people knowledgeable would say we should be cutting back on fiber. Everybody is in agreement that we should eat more vegetable, fruit, beans, and nuts, although some people are being intolerant, just like you can be intolerant of dairy. You know, there are food intolerances out there. But generally speaking, everybody needs more fiber, um, certainly from vegetable and fruits. I mean, potatoes and bananas might have a high glycemic load, so I might restrict those. But otherwise, um, more is better. And if you only made one change and you wanted to help prevent memory loss, prevent heart disease, prevent diabetes, lose weight, look good, lower your blood pressure. I think the most important thing is to eat more fiber, not from cereal or bread, but from vegetable, fruit, beans, and nuts. That's the biggest health benefit we're going to get. I think I, I call this smart fat because the most controversial change I'm asking people to do is add fiber along with smart fat. And if they do those two things, it's life transforming makes an amazing difference in people's health. Now, are both insoluble and soluble fi uh, fibers just as important? Do you strive for one more than the other? Is there a distinguishable difference between the two when we're talking about health? <laughs> well, we, it's a really good point, Noah. So we make a big thing of this in, in laboratories. You know, in a laboratory test tube, is the fiber soluble or not? But from a practical perspective, Soluble fiber sources are better at lowering, improving your cholesterol profile, improving your blood sugar level. So that means like vegetable, fruit, and beans, and nuts, those are the best, and oats are the best sources of soluble fiber. You know, um, vegetables are, the insoluble is what um, is really good for our gut and helps feed the microbiome, the bacteria in our intestinal tract. And they're both really important. So I just think if you really focus on eating more vegetable, fruit, beans, and nuts, you don't even have to worry about is it soluble or insoluble. You really want a nice mixture of both. And if you focus on those foods, you're going to get it. Even though they have their own specific benefits that are unique to each other. Yeah, that's that's a fantastic point, and I, and I agree with you 100%. Now, uh, so let's just use me an example. I've read your book. I'm really into it. I go to a restaurant. Uh, I'm looking for smart fat options, you know, clean protein options. Give, give the audience an idea of what they should be looking for uh, to really help them along the way when they're going to a restaurant. So in a restaurant, it's all going to depend on where you live and where you go. <laughs> you know, if you're going to a big chain, um, you're probably best off looking for wild seafood you know, because that's going to be clean. 
you know, I mean, what's the chance they're going to have grass-fed steak on the menu? Well, a lot of places are starting to do that because people are asking and they're insisting. So, I mean, those are good questions to ask. I'm looking for, you know, talking to the waiter, nice, big smile, friendly. Hey, I'm looking, what, what would you suggest for some clean protein options that you've got on your menu? You know, what's grass-fed? What, you know, cage-free, organic-fed poultry, wild fish? What have you got? If they got nothing, I'm going to order vegetarian. I mean, I don't want toxic food. Right. And sadly, in the past, that's, that. you know, I'd say in the 90s and up till now, that's been predominantly what you'd find in a restaurant. But times are changing. And a lot of restaurants are now marketing, you know, wild salmon on the menu or, you know, mussels, oysters, or cage-free organic chicken, or grass-fed beef. I mean, those things are popping up, but you have to ask. If you don't ask, you you might just get a load of pesticides, hormones, and toxins. The other option is if they've got nothing, and you're out with like a work group, and you know, you're going where they're going, you don't have any choice, then I, instead of clean, I would go with lean. I'd look for a lower fat option. I would chew, if you're going to eat, you know, a steak, you might be better off having it at home when you can buy grass fed. Um, so if you can't find clean, then you go with lean. The lower the fat, the less toxin, hormone, and pesticide is in it. So, you know, focus more on, you know, non-fat dairy or chicken breast, turkey breast, those options. And that's a way to get around it if you're eating in a place that doesn't have clean food. That's a great point. Now, 80% of the meat that I have in my house I get from U.S. wellness meats, and then the rest I get from either Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. Okay. Um, where, do you, where do you – do you just go to Whole – like where do you buy your meats from? Well, so I, I go overboard. <laughs> you know, for most of my seafood, I catch. Great. You know, so I go to Alaska each summer, and I take my kids, and we go fishing – and we, that, you know, that's like 150 pounds of fish. I come home with vacuum pack. That's about three pounds a week. That's pretty good. Um, you know, I'll go to some, you know, in my, I live in Florida and we have, you know, the equivalent of, we do have Trader Joe's and that's usually most of the stuff there is pretty well labeled. You can find poultry and eggs and all that stuff that's organic, cage free, all of that. If you, you know, um, it's a little harder if you're looking for like beef, grass fed. You can find that. I, you have to go to the health food store or basically. But in some places, they carry it now at, you know, Target. So it all depends what city you live in, where you're at, what's available. Um, so for animal protein and eggs, I think certainly poultry is the easiest. Wild fish is easier. Um, you just have to learn what's available where. And, but I would even say the regular Safeway, Thriftway, Target, Publix, those are shifting. And you can find a lot of the things I'm talking about at those places. Not everything, but you can probably find two-thirds of what you shop there now. I'm getting the impression that your ideal protein is wild-caught fish. Is, is that a correct assumption? Well, it has the highest source of long chain omega threes, which lower inflammation. So, but not everybody likes it. I mean, I you know I've I've done six, seven hundred public pres presentations, and I usually somewhere in there will stand, you know, wave and say, "Put my hand up." Who out there likes salmon and sardines, <laughs> and who doesn't? You know, and I would say half the audience does not. So they just don't like that flavor. So you're going to have to come up with a plan that matches every, you know. Taste buds are very different. You know, in a restaurant, the goal is that you enjoy your food and you have fun. So it's trying. So my goal as a chef, and when I help people choose recipes, is to give them a variety of choices from to choose from. And I ask them, okay, let me give you a big variety of foods to add and make more eat. Make more of those choices. Pick the foods that are good for you and eat them more often. I think that's a really easy strategy. When we tell people you can't eat this and you have to eat that, it's so limiting. Um, I prefer to give them their own smorgasbord to choose from and have them focus more intently on that and just be more choosy and selective. Yeah, what I'm hearing from you is is real. What and what I really like is individualistic diets within this smart, fat, clean protein style of eating, which I really like. Not I totally agree, Noah. I mean, the idea of you only get to eat this and you can't eat that, and so rigid. 
I don't think that's not going to work for 70, 80 percent of people. We've got to personalize it in both health issues, which are different, taste issues and texture issues. I mean, do you enjoy the food? Nobody's going to eat cardboard consistently if it's good for them. We've got to figure out for each individual, what foods do you like, how to make it easy to prepare and give you the tools to succeed doing that. Uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, and, and and like I said, I love to eat. I grow a lot of my own vegetables, and and things just have to be tasty. Nice. Do 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 spices and herbs play a big role into your culinary teaching of how to eat this way? <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, spices and herbs, by weight, are probably the most important anti-inflammatory food we eat. So if we want to slow aging. Rev our metabolism so we burn more calories and we can be trim and fit. If we want to protect our brains and our hearts, we want to improve our romantic life, we need more spice <laughs> and herbs in our diet. And, and it's what makes our food taste good. You know, so we definitely, absolutely need more Italian herbs, curry spices, chili spices, you know, garlic, ginger, cinnamon. I mean, Yes, they, they are anti-inflammatory, they rev our metabolism, they block aging, and they make food taste good. So I think if there were four keys, it would be eat, know the difference between smart and dumb fat, you know, eat more fiber and clean protein with it, use lots of herbs and spices, and make sure to cook your food at the right temperature. And if you just do those steps, it's going to totally transform your health for the better, and it's going to be a lot more fun to eat. That's, so So that's a simple summary of your plan right there, those four things, right? Yeah. That's great. Now, as we wind down, Dr. Masley, uh, bonus benefits of following this program, following the more spices, the, the clean protein, the knowing between smart and dumb fats and cooking at the right temperature, what kind of, benef what kind of benefits can our audience see or, or feel or live when they're when they're doing this on a day-to-day -day basis well definitely for people who need to lose weight weight loss i mean if you're if you're trying to get off a few pounds this kind of eating when you lower your inflammation it raises your calorie burn every minute of the day even when you're sitting at your desk and your food's more satisfying and you feel happier eating it so weight loss Cognitive performance, your brain speed improves. Our published data is that our patients on average have a 25% improvement in mental sharpness and executive function. Um, romantic function, I mean, here's the, you know, not a surprise to me when I think about circulation and heart health, but when you improve your circulation for men and women, you have a significant improvement in romantic function. I mean, I've got lots of patients who come to see me taking these little blue pills and I explain, if you follow this program, you probably won't need them anymore. And most of the time they don't. And their functions better without, you know, it improves. And then recipes. You know, do you want foods that are easy to prepare, you can make in 20 minutes, that your family and friends will love, and that will just be awesome and delicious and, and incredible for your health? So those, I think those are all the side effect benefits of this Smart Fat plan. And um, I'm just really grateful to have had the um, opportunity to get my message out and make a difference in people's lives and see improvement. Yeah, me, me too, me too. Dr. Mousley, do you have any final words for us? Well, too often people are, the normal response is to procrastinate. Let's wait till something bad <laughs> happens before we fix it. It's like I'm on this road and it's really comfortable and I'm just going to keep driving straight ahead. I don't want to do any detours. But the problem is for many people, the bridge is out up ahead and you know you're in for a terrible surprise. So as a physician, someone who sees patients and sees people headed over that cliff, um, you know, I'm like, turn change do it now don't you know the first sign of heart disease is oftentimes a heart attack stroke or death it's too late the first sign of memory loss is that your memory shot and it's too late if you were past the point of mild cognitive impairment your brain has actually shrunk already um, you fall and break a hip and your you know your life is over I mean so take steps now that 
with food that's delicious to eat that'll transform your life. Don't wait. Do it now. That would be my biggest take-home point. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Mousley. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. My name is Dr. Noah DeCoyer, your co-host, and you are listening to the Beyond Your Wildest Genes podcast. If you like what you've heard today, please share this with your friends and encourage them to subscribe on iTunes. Leaving a review on iTunes would be an icing on the cake. Thank you. You can subscribe to our incredible weekly email at www.centerforepigeneticexpression.com. Thank you. And as my oldest son Hayden says, be awesome and never unawesome. <laughs>